in 2 Kings chapter number 6. Really, I'm just going to start verse 11. The Bible says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. What thing? He had been planning to overthrow Israel. And he'd been seeking to overthrow Israel. But Israel had a man of God in it by the name of Elisha. And Elisha would send word to the king of, of Israel all the secrets of the king of Syria. And so this troubled the king. Let's read on. It said, And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He's wanting to know who the traitor was, revealing all their secrets. In verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And can I help you something? You can hide it from the preacher. You can hide it from your spouse. You can hide it from mom and dad. You can hide it from your brother or sister. You can hide it from everybody you think, but you can't hide from God. He knows you're down sitting in your uprising. He knows your thoughts, and he even knows the intents of your heart. And the Bible said, be sure your sins will find you out. It's not in the message, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Verse 13. And he said, who? The king of Syria. Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, <coughs> for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Hmm? This servant's having a little problem. He wakes up, sees all these chariots and all these horsemen, all these soldiers surrounding the city, and he panics. He'd be a good Baptist right there. Then the man of God says, What are you afraid of? Fear not. Let me just stop right here. What are you all afraid of? Hmm? Uh, don't tell me you have faith. Show me you have faith. My faith is greater than my fear. Hmm? That's why I, I really don't care about wearing a diaper on my face. I'm not afraid. Hmm? Uh, you ought to be more afraid getting behind the wheel of a car and driving around Florence. Uh, some of you are afraid of some of the silliest things. Do you not know that your very breath is in God's hands? Hmm? Anyway, that's another message. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Now look here. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You say, why are you not afraid, preacher? You don't know who's around us. That's good. That's good, Pastor. Uh, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And even if all we had was him, that's enough. Uh, all right, let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, I'm glad you say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Lord, even when it looks bleak and it looks like a bad day, you can turn it into a good day. Because you're in control. Now, Father, thank you for the word of God. A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our, fat, uh, unto our feet, and God, God, or unto our path. And God, the word of God is what grows our faith. Lord, we need faith in this day and age. Lord, I'm reminded when you walked among men, you said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Lord, there's a lot of religion, not a lot of faith. God, help us this day. Increase our faith. Now, God, you know the need of everybody here. Lord, I don't even know where I'm at. I've been on the road, been down 
walking around the mouse and all kinds of things and Lord you know that I myself have nothing to offer these people Lord you know that I was studying on something over there on Philippians and God you put all this together in my heart last night so God I pray you'd help these dear folks you know what is needed God that one that is lost I pray you'd save them God that one that is saved but Lord their, their garments are filthy with sin I pray they'd get right with God today God, that one that is saved, that is trying to live for God but struggling, I pray you'd increase their faith. God, that one that is seeking your face and seeking revival, may they find it fresh in their soul today. God, that one that just has questions, I pray you'd give them the answers. God, uh, whatever any other need is, I pray you'd be met in Christ today. Now, Father, use this unworthy vessel. Help your people. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've already taken up much more time than I intended, but oh well, it's just time. This is how much I'm concerned about time. I still hadn't set my watch up. I'm, I'm, Lord have mercy. It's, it's 20 to 11. I'm running good, huh? I hadn't worn a watch in a week. I put it on. I said, well, I need to change that. Well, I still need to change it. I'm not worried about it. Hey, Elisha, the man of God, had been exposing the plans of the king of Israel or the king of Syria against the king of Israel now there are some things that begin to transpire as a result of that let me help you something anytime you start exposing sin anytime you start making a stand for God there are going to be folks who don't like it there are going to be repercussions and they're not always good after it is announced about Elisha, we find that there is a blockade. We find the city of Dothan is now being blockaded by the king of Syria's host uh, and all these chariots and footmen. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, there is blindness. First, there's the blindness of uh, Elisha's servant. All he can see is the problem. That's what some of you all's problem is this morning. All you can see is the bad. All you can see is the problem. All you can see is how this is not uh, going to turn out good for you. Can I help you with something? Uh, uh, sometimes God allows bad things to happen to bring us uh, to a place where we'll get closer to God. Sometimes God has to break us uh, in order to bless us. And so sometimes He allows things to happen so we'll quit looking at the problem and we'll start looking to him. That's what transpires with the Gehazi, the servant Elijah. When God opened his eyes and he's no longer blinded, he sees that God was there to take care of him. Sometimes God has to do some work in our lives to open our blinded eyes. But as a result of this, what God did, he didn't slay the whole Syrian army. He just struck them with blindness. So there's a blockade and then there's blindness. And then God had the man of God uh, uh, to lead the blind folks uh, over to where he fed them, gave them water. Now wouldn't you think that God would take that blind army who is pursuing God's people and smote them? That's what I think. I know if I'm God, I'm slaying every one of them suckers. Huh? I wouldn't even use blindness. I'd use lightning bolts. Crispy critters right there on the mountainside. But I'm not God. See, God does everything in a distinct order. And he does everything for a purpose. Now, when I continue on, you're going to really wonder about some of the things that God allowed to happen. Keep in mind, he could destroy that army right here. Well, the Bible goes on to say that the king of Syria would never seek after to besiege Jerusalem again. But the next thing after the blindness, he does besiege a city, Samaria. And things get rough down there in Samaria. After the besieging of, of, of Samaria, and, and by the way, Miss Melissa, when they would besiege a city, that's how they'd defeat them. They'd just surround it, not let any supplies come in or come out. Now you can last for a little while. Why you got flour and why you got a little oil, you can make a cake and if you got a 
a goat. You can have a little goat's milk, a little lamb's meat. But after a while, the flour runs out, oil runs out, livestock runs out, vegetables runs out. There's nothing in there, and people would surrender because they have nothing to eat. Can I help you with something? When it comes to having food and things to eat, people will follow anybody or do anything to make sure they got food. If you don't believe that, you haven't paid attention in the last year. People become sheep if they think safety and food's involved. Okay, nobody believes that. Hmm? Huh? Just watch in the next couple of weeks now that they're lowering the ages for the vaccines, how many people are lining up for the vaccine. Go ahead and help yourself. You help yourself. There's folks getting it. I'm not against you getting it. But don't come whining me that you got sick after you took the virus. Duh, they're sh shooting you up with stuff that's going to make you sick. They besiege Samaria. What happens? They run out of food. You know what they do? They started boiling their children and eating their children. That's real spiritual. Where's that falling every day's a good day and uh, every day's a Friday and Joel Olstein stuff? That is incomprehensible to us that folks would boil their own children and to spare their children what they're going through and then eat their children. Hmm? Honey, Daddy loves you. I'm going to boil you up now. Really, that's inconceivable. We can't fathom that in America. You've never been hungry, let alone been to a point where your mind would say, you know what? They're more tender. Let's try them. Hmm? The boiling of children goes on. This all here, you can read it when you get home. And by the time you get to chapter 7, they belittle the man of God. Can I help you with something? When everything's going good, people don't believe the man of God. If you don't believe that, read the book of Jeremiah. Everything in society was going good. They were living wicked, and God was fed up with them. And God sent men of God down there to preach them and warn them. And they didn't believe the men of God. But then when things turn and everything goes bad, they begin to blame the man of God. They belittled the man of God. The one who had spared their lives how many times by letting them know what the king of Syria was going to do. Now, they're belittling him. Matter of fact, he begins to prophesy in chapter 7 what's going to transpire. And those that belittled him, he said, but it doesn't matter. You're not going to see any of it. And then God uses the base things. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul said God chooses the base things to confound the wise. Now, we think that God would use the mighty, the noble, the powerful. When we think of Samson, we think of that big strapping man that was strong enough to just... But Samson, he was just a little wimpy guy. I want to pick out somebody right now, but if I do, I don't know if your psyche could handle it, and I don't want you to go see a psychiatrist, but let me just say, Samson didn't look like Peter. All right? Matter of fact, they all marveled at where his strength came from. God always chooses to do things in an unusual way. Things that you and I would think would never work, God uses. I mean, uh, uh, the greatest enemy, a uh, 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 single enemy that Israel ever faced, Goliath the giant, uh, God sent a shepherd boy out there with a sling and a stone, uh, and God took care of business. God uses unusual and base things. Uh, now look at chapter 7. We'll get to where I want to get to. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, and there were four leprous men. It doesn't get any more base than these four guys right here. This is the off-scour of the world. This is the rudiments of the world. This is as low and as base as you can get right here. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate 
And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. Uh, if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. What a blessing. This, guy's, this crowd's got it. Can I say, first of all, they have a death sentence. They are four leprous men. There was no cure for leprosy. I've got news for you. 3,000 years later, there's still no cure for leprosy. Leprosy is a picture or a type of sin. There's no cure for sin. There's a cleansing for sin, uh, and it's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we find these men had a death sentence. Uh, uh, a leprosy was going to bring forth death. Uh, and they said, uh, if we sit here, we're going to die. Uh, if we go into the city where the famine is and they're eating their children, we're going to die. Uh, if we go to the host of the Syrians, maybe they'll have compassion on us, uh, but probably not, and they're probably going to kill us. Uh, we're going to die. They came to that conclusion. At a death sentence. Notice, not only that, they were detached from society. They were at the entering end of the gate. They weren't even allowed in where the public was. They're detached from society. Hmm? You ever feel like you don't fit in? You ever feel like you're on the outside looking in? Do you ever go at work, there's a congregation of people talking, you show up and they all get quiet and then disband, you, all, you feel like you got the plague? Huh? At the family reunion, they'd make you sit at the kiddie table because nobody wants to talk to you. They are detached from society. They have a death sentence. But notice, if you will, they decide to change their situation. Look again at verse 3. Why sit we here until we die? If we say we enter in, they go on through all that. But they said, why are we going to sit here till we die? And let me just finish it. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, what I'm going to preach on. But hey, they decide they'll go try out the Syrian host. Uh, what happens uh, in the midst of the night? Uh, uh, God sent a noise among the camp uh, of the Syrian army. Uh, they thought that uh, 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 Israel had joined up with the Egyptians and the Hittites. Uh, they thought a great army was coming upon them. Uh, they they were so afraid, uh, they just ran and left it all. They left their chariots, uh, they left their horses, uh, they left their swords, uh, they left their gold, uh, they left their silver, uh, and they left their food. Uh, hey, these four leprous men that were the base uh, that nobody would have anything to do with, they went seeking mercy, uh, and they found a bounty. Uh, they ate all they could eat. Uh, they enjoyed the blessings. Uh, hey, and these guys weren't Baptists because uh, they said, hey, uh, uh, people are starving to death up here in the city. Uh, let's go and tell them where they can find some bread. Hallelujah. God used the base to change the whole situation. But this is what I want to preach on. They said, why sit we here till we die? I want to preach on doing something is better than doing nothing. Now you can sit there, dry up on the vine, die spiritually, you can sit there and say there is no hope. Uh, if I go to Walmart, i got to wear a mask. Uh, if I go to a gas station, i got to wear a mask. Uh, if I go here, I can't do this, can't do that. I'm going to sit down and do nothing. You can do that. Some people come to church, sit down, get up, go out, and doesn't let them impact them at all. You know why, Brother Tommy? Because they're sitting there till they die. Other people, Brother Josh, say, I can't change the world, so I won't change anything. I mean, you look around the world, I mean, there, Jesus is coming, there ain't no hope. Uh, I mean, you look around, you watch some of the commercials, you watch some of the TV programs, you see what, all that's going on. I mean, we got a president, can't even walk up the steps, get on a plane. I mean, we are in a mess. We are. <laughs> Mashed potato brains has no bones in his feet, evidently. And in that great, awesome news channel, CNN said the wind blew him down. Well, if the wind blows him down, we're in trouble. 
Supposed to be the most powerful man in the free world. Can't even climb a step. He didn't fall once, he fell three times. Uh, Hey, hey, I don't know much, but I always was told three strikes and you're out. But Trump was mean. At least he could climb the steps. At least you ask him a question and he knew he was the president. I'm telling you, there are people that think they can't impact anything, so they do nothing. Doing something's better than doing nothing. Listen, no matter how helpless you may feel, no matter how hopeless it may seem, no matter how hard it may be, sometimes there are hard things. Hmm? Some days, they're bad days. Trust me, I know. Huh? No matter how big a hole you may have dug for yourself, no matter how hurt you may have been, become, you can do something about it. Now you could sit there and waller in your pity and die. Or you can do something. Miss hmm? Nett read this quote this week. It was really impactful. So I'm using it now. You can't wish for it. You've got to work for it. Let me say it again. You can't wish for it. You've got to work for it. Now you can come sit on your little pew and wish God sends revival. It ain't going to happen. Revival's going to cost you something. You've got to work for it. You got to pray, seek God's face, turn from your wicked ways. Are you listening? Uh, 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 you've got to work for it, not wish for it. You can wish for your your loved ones to get saved, and they never get saved. You got to work for it. Hmm? You got to uh, uh, work. You got to do something to impact this world. We're in the mess we're in because for the last fifty years, churches haven't done anything. We've come in and wished for kumbaya, and we've got the mess we're in. God chose us to impact this world. God uses human agencies to affect human situations. You can sit here till you die, or you can do something. Hmm? Listen, you may ask, what can I do? Well, first of all, you can pivot. You can pivot. You can turn from whatever situation you're in. Them four guys made a pivot. They said, we're not going to sit here. We're going to do something. If you're here today and you're lost without Christ, you can sit here and die and go to hell. Or you can do something about it. You can turn from your situation, your sinful life, and turn to Jesus. You can make a pivot today. Huh? If you know you're lost, you can get saved. All you got to do is believe on the Lord. All you got to do is use repentance and faith. Come and turn to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. He'll save you today. Hmm? He came seeking to save that which is lost. He died on the cross so you wouldn't go to hell. He wants to save you more than you want to be saved, I promise you. You can be saved today. You say, preach, I'm saved, but my life's a mess. It don't have to be. You got to turn to the Lord. Hmm? You can waller in your mess and complain about it, and cry about it, and stay in your mess, and you know what you're going to be—a muddy mess. Or you can say, "I'm sick of it," and turn to the Lord. That prodigal was in the hog pen. Uh, you know anything about Jewish custom uh, uh, and Jewish law? The worst place you can find a Jew boy is in a hog pen. Uh, he's in a hog pen, uh, uh, slapping the hogs. Uh, you don't know what that means? Google it. Uh, uh, but Brother Bob, uh, he was so hungry, he would have liked to have what the hogs were eating. Uh, and he came to himself. Uh, he says, the hired servants of my father's house uh, got it better than this. Uh, and he made a pivot. Uh, he came to himself uh, and he got up out of the hog pen uh, and headed home uh, when he got to the father uh, hey uh, he 
he found there was a robe awaiting on him. Uh, there was a ring awaiting on him. Uh, hey, he found there was a feast waiting on him. Uh, hey, your mess uh, can turn into a bountiful feast uh, if you'll get out of your mess and turn to the Lord. Uh, he made a pivot. Listen, one man once said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Your hope for your mess starts with one step toward Jesus. The Bible says, draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. Hmm? Say, when do I know to stop when you run into Him? Might only take one step. Just, just, keep, just keep headed in His direction. You'll find Him. Uh, what can I do, preacher? You can make a pivot. And can I say this? You can pray. There's a lot of things we can't do, Brother Bob. You being a great grandpa, there's a lot of things you used to do, you'd like to be able to do, but you've come to a realization you just can't do them. It got up and went. You know what I'm saying? I heard that in a song one time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you wrote that song how many years ago? Yeah, it just turned 40. So a long time ago. Long time ago. And if it was true then, what about now? Huh? Listen, I proved my manhood this week. I rode every coaster. I rode everything. I did it all. Huh? I did, man, because I know there's coming a day I'm going to be sitting out there with the strollers watching everybody else ride them. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It's a coming. But I did it. I was a trooper. We made up our mind we're not going back till we have grandkids. I won't be riding all that mess. I'll be in kiddie land then. You know what I'm saying? Uh, can I help you something? There are a lot of things you can't do. Not everybody has the talent to play an instrument. Not everybody has the talent to sing. Some of you think you can, but you can't, okay? Uh, I don't want to hear make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You may think it's joyful, but everybody around you isn't being joyful. You know what I'm saying? Uh, not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody has the gift to teach. Not everybody can do everything. That's why God fitly framed us together. There's a lot of things that I can't do, and there's a lot of things that you can't do, but there's one thing we can all do, and that's pray. Matter of fact, it's so important and so impactful and a thing that everybody can do, but very few do it. Because we all want to sing. Or we all want to do somebody else's job. Just bloom where you're planted, friend. Pray. You know, the most impactful thing in this world is prayer. When you shut out the world and you begin to call on God, all of heaven stops. And the heavens take heed to what you're asking God for. You move heaven towards earth when you call on the Lord. But we don't pray about it much. Why, I read this. But let me say this first. The Scriptures calls us to pray. We're called to pray. We're commanded to pray. Pray without ceasing. We're challenged to pray. But we're prone co to complain rather than to pray. One of my favorite writers, Oswald Chambers, said this. The very powers of darkness are paralyzed by prayer. No wonder Satan tries to keep our minds fussy and active work till we cannot think to pray. He said this, The prayer of the feeblest saint on earth who lives in the Spirit and keeps right with God is a terror to Satan. He also said this, We have to pray with our eyes on God, not on our difficulties. So what can I do, preacher? You can pray. Just find you somewhere and camp there and begin to ask God to change the situation. Because nothing's impossible with our God. 
What can you do? Well, you can pivot. You don't have to stay there. You can pray. Can I help you something? You can push through fear. Amen. You can. Hey, several years ago when the kids were young, Miss Annette and I took them to one of them real wild amusement parks where the coasters me on the ground watching it I'm getting <laughs> you know what my darling wife said she said you can do anything for 40 seconds we wrote them all so what happened I ain't been back since but we wrote them all <laughs> you can push through fear now listen, you all know I used to play a little ball, used to be an athlete. Now I eat Swiss rolls, all right? You know, I, I, I played about everything. We didn't have hockey back in those days. We'd all broke our necks on skates anyway. We didn't have hockey in this area. We didn't have lacrosse back those days and all that. They just introduced soccer. That was a stupid sport back then. It's become a real sport, but to us it was stupid because you couldn't hit anybody. I'll never forget this. My first experience in soccer, you know, keep in mind, I'm thinking of grass fairies, I'm thinking this is stupid, right? Okay. Yeah, right. Well, here's the deal. I go sliding in to kick the ball away. Did a good job. What I didn't realize, all them guys around me, they don't stop kicking. I got kicked in the head, kicked in the nose, kicking, and you can't get up and punch them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can't pick up the ball and throw it and bounce it off their head. I realize... It's pretty rough. But there's a lot of things that I did play at, enjoyed, did all that stuff. But there was one crew I never did understand, Brother Bob, Brother Josh, wrestlers. <laughs> you all are a weird breed. <laughs> they were chiseled out of rock and were at 170. But they said, if I lose five pounds, I can wrestle at 165. So they put on plastic bags and would run for hours and, and just drink water and sweat all this weight off so they could get down to 165 and go wrestle. And then they'd go wrestle at 165 instead of 170. And they did weird stuff like this. I mean, all that sweating, I shared a locker room with them. It stunk, man. Yeah. And them pads, they rolled them up. And I mean, horrible. I mean, terrible. And that was in the old Berg you know, locker room, man. It wasn't in that fancy one you got to enjoy. No. no. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad. Wrestlers were weird. But you know what a wrestler told me one time? He said, the human body, if it can endure six minutes of pain, it becomes numb and then pain is no longer in a cause. Now I'm not man enough to try out six minutes of pain. But there comes a point when whatever is ailing you, you can push through it. I did used to do a little cross country running. Let me go back here and talk to my runners. Grace is already laughing. I'm not even going to talk to him. She used to run. Now she runs after Riker. Now, we didn't run on tracks and stuff. We ran over the river and through the woods. How you doing, bud? And, and can I say something about cross-country running? It's great till you run against stupid schools like Bethel. <laughs> we ran a mile. We get to Bethel. I'm running. I'm about to die. I'm not kidding you. I'm about to die. I had a pain inside of me. You seen that movie Alien? He was inside of me. <laughs> I didn't find out till after the course. Our coach knew. He didn't tell us. Bethel decided they was taking the course to two and a half miles. Where were you? We're trained to run a mile, huh? Miss Marathon triathlete. I wasn't trained for that. A mile, I'm done. A mile, where's the milkshakes? You know what I'm saying? But what I found, when I hit that wall, that pain, I just kept running. 
and the pain subsided. I'm trying to help you this morning. Some of you are here today and you're facing some fear. You're facing something you never thought you would face. It has your personal life messed up. It has your home life messed up. It has your church life messed up. It has every facet of you get up in the morning, it's there. You go to bed at night, it's there. Throughout your day, you're reminded. No matter what you do to get your mind off of it, it's there. You can push through your fear. The Bible says this in Psalms 56 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. You can push through your fear. You've just got to learn to look to Him. He'll help you, friend. Preacher, what can I do? You can make the conscious choice that fear is not going to control you anymore. You're going to turn it over to the Lord. Can I say this? What can I do, preacher? You can participate. Why sit you here till you die? Doing something is better than doing nothing. Get involved. Participate. Make up your mind you're going to do something. Hmm? Hmm. Paul wrote to Philippians, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You can do something. You may not be able to do everything. You can do something. You may end up in the Syrian uh, Syrian camp and find a whole feast there. You may just go across the street. I don't know, but you can do something for Christ. We've got enough things around here for you to get involved in. If you find something that you want to get involved in, we're not doing. Hey, let's just do it. Get involved. Do something. Participate. The more we talk about work, the less we work. One writer said this, God will do everything I cannot do, but He will do nothing that He has constructed me to do. If God in His Word has told us to do something or not to do something, it's left up to us to do it or not to do it. If it's bigger than us, God can handle it, and He will handle it. But there are some things He expects us to handle. Just quit sitting, start doing. Participate. You can do something. Hmm? every week I go by that table out there and, and not one week, not one week, not one week has it been totally empty of all the tracks. There are plenty of tracks out there. Take one, give it to somebody. Everybody goes through drive throughs when they give you a Coke, say, here, read this on your break. Give them a track. Hmm. Do like Tony. Go to Kroger, put them in the, in the soft drink box uh, cartons. Huh? You used to put them in the beer cartons, they started calling me. Uh, put them in the bathrooms just leave them somewhere somebody might pick it up and read and get saved you never know I know one thing if you don't leave them they're not going to read it Mm. you can participate Mm. but John's sitting here I'm going to pick on him most of you know he owns his own shop he has to call and order parts whoever picks up that phone I feel sorry for him First thing John's going to say, they're going to say, what part number are you looking for? He's going to say, are you born again? You know you're going to save. You, if you die tonight, you know you're going to heaven. He's going to witness to them. Hmm? Say, is that effective? He's won people to the Lord over the phone. But I know one thing, if all he does is give them part number, he's never going to win anybody. Say, well, preacher, did they really get saved? I don't know. It's between them and God. But I know one thing, if he didn't ask them if they were, you know, wanted to be saved, they would never get saved. You can do something. Hmm? Say, well, that's not my thing. Well, find your thing and do it for Jesus' sake. Hmm? What can I do? You can persevere. Hmm? Romans 12, 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You can persevere. You'd be amazed at how you can impact people's life by just being good to people. Just being kind to people. Just be giving towards people. Hmm? 1 Corinthians 13, everybody knows this chapter. Verse number 4 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. 
beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Overcome evil with good. You can persevere by stop wallowing in your mess. You can sit there till you die, or you make up your mind, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I'm going to show some goodness to people. It's amazing when you start thinking on good things and you start doing good things and you start uh, believing good things, how much your outlook in life changes. All of a sudden, it's no longer a chore, it's a joy. Preacher, what can I do? You can prove. The world is looking to see if all this about Jesus Christ is real. You can prove that it's real. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. You're never going to world, win the world acting like the world. Never going to win the world smelling like the world. You're never, ever going to use the world's philosophies to, and, and impact them with Christ. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to constantly work on your mind because your mind wants to think negative that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can prove it. Prove that Jesus is real by making up your mind. You're not going to sit there till you die. And you're going to think on things that are lovely. Think on things that are above. Think on things of good report. Think on things that are, have virtue. You start thinking the things of Christ, you'll start live in the things of Christ and when you start living the things of Christ you'll prove to others that Christ is real listen if you or I are ever going to get any help from the Lord we're ever going to do something instead of doing nothing first of all you're going to have to be honest with, our, with yourself i got to be honest with myself are you drying up on the vine are you sitting there till you die? Are you doing nothing? Or are you going to do something? You've got to be honest. Most of the time, Brother Eddie, we live our lives trying to impress somebody else. It would be a good day in your life when you come to the end of yourself. And you realize it's no longer about you. I told you all several years ago, I, long, I no longer have an ego. I don't care who God uses. Some of y'all still think that God has to sit on you in order for God to move. I'll never forget that service when Zachary, where you at? Stand up. I want everybody to see your mullet. That is ridiculous, son. Go go to the barber. Stand up. How tall are you? About six five? Six four? Six four and still growing. Huh? I want you to get a good look at him. Because, you know, he can't buy a striped suit because it only have one stripe in it. But you're going to fill out one of these days. You're going to get fat like me. I just want you to understand that. <laughs> I remember when Zachary was, Charlie, stand up. Charlie, five. I remember when Zachary was that tall. Now, I'll never forget in a service, God started moving. He jumped up yeah. with a broken heart. Yeah. Again, testifying about the goodness of God and it broke this whole service voices you can sit down God showed me that night that he could use an 8 year old boy and change it all I don't care who God uses I just want to be around when God's doing something some of you need to get to the end of yourself God flung the stars out there on nothing you and I don't impress God and you just need to be honest with yourself. And the true honesty is you're not worth the powder to take blow away. But somehow, some way, God looked at you and loved you and was willing to die for you. And when you called on him, he saved you. You ought to never get over that. You need to be honest with yourself. Some of you have lied so much to yourself, you believe in the lies. We're ever going to do anything. We need to humble ourselves. God resists us the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I'm not talking about that false humility stuff. False humility don't brag on you. I mean, humility don't brag on you. That's false humility. I don't need to get up and tell you everything I did. God knows what I did and what I didn't do. 
But I will tell you this, when you're humble, people know it. Hmm? Let me say this, you've got to be honest with yourself, you've got to humble yourself, you've got to admit to God you need Him. And then you've got to place all your hope in Christ and Him alone. Without Him, we can do nothing. Doing something is better than doing nothing. There's a lot of people going to go to judgment seat, Brother Jim, have never done nothing for Christ. Hmm? Hey, you don't have to do everything, just do something. Why sit you here till you die? I'm going to say this, I'm going to be done. I make no apologies for what I'm about to say. I think we have a great church. We have great people in our church. We have folks that are giving, folks that are caring, folks that are loving, folks that are compassionate. Uh, I mean, all, all we got to do is make an announcement. We need something. We always get above what we need. That's just how you are. You're the kind of church, it doesn't matter what comes through them doors. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter what they smell like. Doesn't matter where they're going to be. You're going to show them kindness. And you're going to show them the love of Christ. We got a great church. But we don't have a perfect church. The sad commentary is this great church is still an anomaly in this area. It's amazing. We got folks drive 45 minutes, hour, even farther. But there are folks who live down the street don't even know about our church. Why sit we here till we die? We need to do something. Jesus is coming. All the evidence is all around. Say, when's he coming? When the Lord tells him to come, he's coming. We need to be ready. And we need to be busy doing something for Christ. Are you doing anything for Christ? Are you here today and you're not saved? Why don't you get saved today? Are you here today and you're saved but your life's a wreck? Why don't you get it straightened out today? Are you here today and you're tired of sitting and doing nothing? Why don't you do something? Huh? Some of you, all you do is complain. Quit complaining and start doing something. Just do something. Don't have to do everything. Just make up your mind. You're going to do something and do it. Say, preacher, I don't know what to do. Come and ask the Lord. Lord, what can I do? Show me what I can do. He'll show you. And when he does, just do it. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Doing something's better than doing nothing. Are you doing anything? Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, I didn't mean to preach that long, but Lord, I pray you'd take my ineptness and speak to somebody's heart. God, there's folks here that need help. Lord, open their blinded eyes that they'll have enough sense to call on you for help. If they're lost, I pray they'd call on you for salvation. If they're saved, but their life's a mess, I pray they'd call on you to help them out of the hog pen. Lord, if they're saved and they've got a clean life, but Lord, they've just been sitting, God, inspire them to do something. God, help us to impact our world while we can. God, just do something this invitation, speak to hearts. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.